The fall of Germany's monarchy was not the culmination of some sinister grand plan. The Social Democratic Party, which replaced the Kaiser's regime in 1918, didn't even really lead the revolution and had to catch up with citizens on the streets. But unlike some other places, Germany was a mostly cohesive nation-state, and the monarchy was instrumental in originally uniting the country. So then, why couldn't its imperial system, the brainchild of Otto von Bismarck, survive the end of World War I? Why did Kaiser Wilhelm II have to abdicate? Well, Germany's Social Democrats were instrumental players in establishing the Weimar Republic. They were the largest grouping in the German parliament, the Reichstag, and they represented a genuinely popular pro-worker, pro-peace mandate. Which was all well and good, but Imperial Germany was not a parliamentary democracy. Before the revolution, real power rested with the Emperor, and Kaiser Wilhelm II was far from a democrat or a pacifist. He and Germany's militaristic ruling class were focused totally on winning the war. With Wilhelm's blessing, Field Marshal Paul von Hindenburg and General Erich Ludendorff had effectively been military dictators of the country since 1916. From the people's perspective then, the Kaiser was complicit in offering up an entire generation to the war as sacrificial lambs. On the home front, blockades that had lasted for years and a loss of colonial territories also brought about shortages of food and other vital supplies. That's not to say that Germans were totally united in their opposition, though. In fact, the Social Democrats towards the end of the war had split into two factions, the majority and independent SPD, but everyone was certainly upset. Ludendorff himself informed the Kaiser that the war could not be won on the 29th of September 1918, and the military high command then encouraged Wilhelm to begin the process of democratizing his empire. Why would they do that? Two reasons. One, they believed, rightly, that the Entente powers would more readily negotiate with a democratic Germany. And two, more cynically, von Hindenburg and Ludendorff wanted the blame for the war that, make no mistake, they had lost to fall upon a socialist civilian government. The Kaiser was very much on board with that shift the blame plan, and on the 3rd of October, Wilhelm appointed his last imperial chancellor, Prince Max von Baden, to head a reformist government. Von Baden included the first Social Democrats in the history of the Reich in his cabinet, notably Philipp Scheidemann, and began to legislate for a number of reforms that were supposed to limit the Kaiser's power, but keep Wilhelm on the imperial throne. However, whatever they might have liked it to look like, and how it was made to look later, Germany's entire system, embodied by the person of the Kaiser, was totally discredited by the disaster that was World War I. The people felt that their rulers had failed them, and appointing a liberal chancellor and just letting a few socialists into government was not going to be enough to placate them. But plenty of emperors had suffered angry citizens before. They can be stopped if your army remains loyal, and the Kaisers, while it was battered by the war, still could have been. Unfortunately for Wilhelm II, it wasn't going to be. The straw that broke the camel's back came about on October 30th, 1918, when seamen stationed in Kiel were given orders to sail out and engage the Royal Navy. The men flatly refused and began to protest after several were shot. Emboldened by the sailors, Kiel's workers turned that mutiny into the sparks of revolution when they joined them on strike on November 4th. With hindsight, the question was now not whether the Kaiser's regime would fall, but whether it would only be Wilhelm II's personal departure or the end of the monarchy entirely. The Emperor didn't necessarily realise that, though, and remained at his military command post at Spa in occupied Belgium, while Prince von Baden worked to save his dynasty in Berlin. Already by November 2nd, the socialists in the cabinet were pressing the chancellor to demand the Kaiser's abdication. They could do that because the majority social democrats, led by Friedrich Ebert, were the most powerful and popular political force in the country. But the MSPD wasn't devoutly republican, and its leadership may very well have accepted a symbolic monarchy in the style of Britain's parliamentary system if only Wilhelm would go, and if events hadn't gotten ahead of them.
For the moment anyway, the political right was biding its time, so the only real competitor to Ebert's social democrats came from the farther left USPD, and particularly the Spartacus Bund, another splinter group that later reorganized as the Communist Party of Germany. Founded by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, the Spartacists began as an anti-war faction of the Social Democrats in 1914. They then joined the breakaway USPD when the party split three years later, and inspired by the Russian October Revolution, began to call for the overthrow of state and society and the establishment of a German Soviet regime. Suffice to say, they definitely weren't fans of men wearing crowns. Come the last week of the war, the challenge that they presented Ebert and the bulk of the Social Democrats was to manage a balancing act. On the one hand, the political system of Bismarck and Fifty Years Past was going to be replaced. Following the mutiny at Kiel, crowds of workers and soldiers began to form in urban centers across Germany, all demanding peace and a new government to negotiate it. On the other hand, Ebert saw risk in promoting taking to the streets, as most Social Democrats feared the agitation of Marxists like the Spartacus Bund, who may very well have used that to start a Russian Bolshevik-style bloody civil war if left unchecked. On the 6th of November, the Socialist ministers Scheidemann and Gustav Bauer demanded that von Baden represent the Social Democrats fully in cabinet, and again, the abdication of the Kaiser. The first demand was accepted. Things went a step further in Bavaria, Germany's second largest state, after the capitulation of neighboring Austria-Hungary to the Entente. The centuries-old von Wittelsbach dynasty there was forced from power, and a republic was proclaimed in Munich on November 8th by the USPD and MSPD working in tandem, intentionally to the exclusion of their Spartacist cousins. Back in Berlin, on November 9th, a contingent of MSPD politicians led by Ebert confronted the Chancellor. That morning, their patience had broken. A general strike was organized, and the Berlin garrison had sided with the strikers. The rest of the army, still commanded by Field Marshal von Hindenburg, was unwilling to fight against the bulk of Germany's population, and of course, he personally still hoped to pin blame for an armistice on the Democrats and Marxists. And yet, with virtually no one of significance wanting him to stay, Kaiser Wilhelm just couldn't bring himself to voluntarily go into exile. Briefly, he considered abdicating as emperor, but not from the lesser title King of Prussia. That was shot down as legally impossible by von Baden. So, with millions on the streets, the army unwilling to fight for the Kaiser, and the country paralyzed by strikes, von Baden handed over power to the MSPD at their meeting. Technically, that was also illegal. Even under a recently amended constitution, the present chancellor couldn't just hand the job over to whomever he liked. Of course, the thing about revolutions is that during them, laws go out the window, so Germany's new chancellor, Friedrich Ebert, became. Von Baden's last act in government was to announce Wilhelm's abdication, foregoing actually asking him first. Germany was still not a republic, though. That happened minutes later, when Philipp Scheidemann announced the end, not just of Wilhelm, but of the monarchy outright, in a speech to strikers gathered around the Reichstag. Clearly, consultation had fallen completely out of fashion, as he did so without first informing his party leader. Ebert was furious, but the deed had been done. Scheidemann's justification was to emulate Bavaria, outmaneuver the Spartacists, and hopefully keep the revolution peaceful. Unhappy about that, 1919 became a much bloodier year in contrast to the massive, but largely peaceful protests that brought down the Kaiser. Predictably, the Spartacists did try to overthrow the new government, but that was a fight between social democracy and Bolshevism, not over monarchy. As for Wilhelm II, once Max von Baden relinquished power, he could see that the game was up, and fled from Spa to the Netherlands, where he lived in exile for another 23 years. The ex-Kaiser never set foot in Germany again, and even willed that his body not be returned home until the monarchy is restored. He's still in the Netherlands. The empire that Wilhelm lost worked for decades before World War I, though. To find out how, you should check out the video on the German Empire's creation and on Bismarck, its Zion Chancellor, to the left. And as always, I've been James, and I'll see you there.